Welcome to a brand spanking new episode of Who Do You Think You Are? An exploration into how our thoughts, beliefs, and feelings create our reality. My name is Lassia Kahoot and I'm your host. I'm joined by my co-host on this show and in life, Glenn Sheridan. Every episode, we're joined by a special guest who inspires us to consider not only what we think, but how we think, and how that thinking impacts our life experience. It's time to get this conscious conversation started as we ask today's guest, who do you think you are? Hello, hello, and welcome to another brand spanking new episode of Who Do You Think You Are? My name is Lasia, and I'm your host. And as always, I'm here with my co-host on this show and in life, Mr. Glenn Sheridan. Greetings, everyone. And today we have another super special guest that I am really looking forward to talking to because Glenn has actually spent more time with her than I have. And I have heard so much about her through Glenn, through my other spiritual community. And so I'm really, really, really excited to dig into this conscious conversation that I know is already bubbling up and making its way forward. So as we begin, I would just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so eternally grateful to be coming to you from this wonderful, amazing place called Sanichton, where we live, work, breathe, and play on the unceded lands of the Wisconsin people. We are so grateful to be here now. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Ashley, I'm just going to read her bio because it is really short, sweet, and super succinct and to the point. So our super special guest has been a nurse, wife, mother, teacher, medical transcriber, runaway, drunk, administrative assistant, bookkeeper, property manager, realtor, event planner, and minister. Embracing it all, she says, every moment of every day has been preparing me for now. Since 1979, she has been on a spiritual journey of study and teaching. She was ordained by International Association of Churches of Truth in 2001 and has subsequently been a licensed minister serving Centers for Spiritual Living in Winnipeg and Kamloops and Unity Vancouver Island. She currently also serves as president of Unity Canada. Now, I have had one conversation with this amazing person, and I so look forward to having more. And, and I always, always enjoy the little nuggets, ahas, and, and just sort of insights that I get from the Sunday talks that I end up listening to while Glenn is watching from, uh, from our living room what's happening with uh, Unity Vancouver Island coming from Nanaimo. So without further ado, knowing that there is so much more to dig into and explore, I would like to invite Reverend Patricia Zogar to let us know. Reverend Patricia, who do you think you are? Thank you and good morning. First of all, I would like to acknowledge that I'm in the traditional and unceded territory of the Sinanemo Mustikwa and am very grateful. Who do I think I am? I haven't a clue. Um, <laughs> and, and as I think on this question, I realize that we're, we're all of those things that we are. I left out one thing, acting. I'm also an actor. Um, all of the things we are and have been uh, our memories of all of that constitute part of who we are. Um, our attention that we're focused on right now and our aspirations for the future are all of who we are. Um, and my aspirations for the future are to be a, a peace advocate and an Aboriginal ally and a, an addict um, supporter. Um, those things that I think are, are important for me to do yet they're all who I am and they all constitute my consciousness. So I would have to say bottom line is what I am is my consciousness. And my you know, mind. that, I mean, I love that, that, that is what this show is all about. And there have been several people who, after sort of saying what you just did, what you just said in their own way, come around to something like that you know i am consciousness i am the infinite vast pool of consciousness i'm consciousness expressing evolving creating at play something like that and and i think it is it is so cool because for me when this podcast idea first came up it came up out of these kinds of conversations that glenn and i would have together either just the two of us or with friends on our couch after dinner, where we'd be mm -hmm. talking about 
who are we? Are we are, you know, the roles that that the labels that we ascribe to? Are we the expectations that we put on ourselves or that other people um, put on us? Like what exactly is going on? And if you or when you get past the roles, the expectations, the labels, our relationships, our relationships to, um, you know, our job, the people in our life, circumstances or experiences that we have had, the memories like you're talking about, put all that aside, you know, peel all that away, what are you left with? And for me, it's consciousness as well. And, um, and I'm, I think I'm like equally excited to talk to you today, because you have you have a background in centers for spiritual living, yes. which is more of my background. And now you are in unity, which is more of what Glenn is immersed in. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's all very, very similar. And it's all under the new thought umbrella. Yes. And I guess because you're the first minister that we have here that has well, no, Reverend Jonathan Zenz, now he's, mm. he's been in both camps. Um, but when we had him on the show, he was still uh, not as immersed in unity as he is now. But seeing as you have been in both worlds and both worlds have such an incredible crossover, I was wondering if maybe we could talk a little bit about that and, mm -hmm. and what the differences are. Are there differences? How you moved over from you know, centers for spiritual living to unity, um, the meaning, the value, anything that, that you would like to share? Because um, mm -hmm. I'm curious and I'm sure yeah. there might be some other people out there who might be curious. Yeah. Um, so I was in, in centers for spiritual living because my first introduction to New Thought was the Church of Religious Science as it was then yeah. uh, in California. And uh, I did some independent study while I was looking for, because there hasn't been a lot in Canada available to study. Um, and actually I retired, uh, I've retired three times. And the last time I retired, <laughs> doesn't seem to work for me, was in 2013 when I re returned to the island from Kamloops. And my daughter had invited me uh, to come. She just purchased a farm with two houses on it. And I had my other daughter with me at the time who had just been released from hospital after three months um, resulting from a heroin overdose. And so with the two of us thought, well, this is good. We'll move to a nice farm, natural, healthy environment, and we will retire. Well, I was retired for about six months. And someone advised me, I used to go to, to Campbell River to speak and some at the Center for Spiritual Living there. And someone advised me that Nanaimo was without a minister and they were looking for guest speakers and I should call them. And then about oh, six months later, I was out of retirement again. And the reason it's uh, unity instead of centers for spiritual living is that's the community that was here. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to start a center for spiritual living and, and split that community in half and have two communities that were not viable. Right. And so the teachings are similar enough that, you know, it was a good fit. I've always um, sensed that the main difference between the two teachings, the, the empowering, you know, creative, you do it, you're, you're responsible for your own life. That's constant for both mm -hmm. of them. Unity people, to some extent, some people tend to be more in touch with the Christian roots. Mm -hmm. I mean, both teachings grew out of America. Mm -hmm. America has always been a Christian country mm -hmm. and, and, developed by people who grew up with Christianity. So it, it nat it's natural that the Fillmore's who developed unity tried to interpret Christianity differently mm -hmm. so that it was more palatable to, to what we're teaching. And that's really the difference. Uh, Ernest Holmes also, the Science of Mind text, there's lots of Christian references in there, yep. stories of Jesus and so forth. But basically, for the most part, unity is more in touch and at the top level too, officially. Mm -hmm. But what is true is that in unity, there are, there are congregations that are practically Pentecostal, mm -hmm. uh, very attached to the, the Christian liturgy and the rit ritual. And there were, are congregations that don't ever want to hear the word God or Jesus or Bible. Yeah. And they're more, much more into new agey type stuff. And they're all part of unity. Yeah. Um, so what, what's precious for me is this ability to 
to take what works for me and build a, a belief or a foundation that I can work with. And I really don't have to explain it to anyone else. It's, it's accepted. And that, of course, opens me up to be accepting of where other people are. And uh, I was brought up without religious training, so I resisted Christianity for quite a bit. But I'm, I'm relaxing a little and, and being able to welcome the beautiful teachings of Jesus um, interpreted to how they work to my life, how they're relevant. You know, I think that's the whole thing. We have to be relevant to today's people or, or they're not going to want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, oh, there were so many things that you just said that I could go and unpack and, and sort of branch out on the relevance because you just said it, that, that for me, that for me, I think is key. I think, you know, that is when we were still in Toronto five and a half years ago, before we moved here to, um, to the island, when we walked into the Center for Spiritual Living Toronto, which has since changed to become a global truth center Toronto. Mm. Um, when we, it wasn't my first time walking in, but when Glenn and I walked in together a few years after the first time that I walked in, that was the day where I found like I'd found my spiritual home. That was the day mm -hmm. where I found, I felt like I had connected with my community, my people. And I was just, I felt so welcome. I felt so just connected like that was the big word for me and and so much of it had to do with not just the hugs and the smiles and we're so glad you're here at the door which were very genuine um mm -hmm. there was also this added element of like oh my gosh I'm seeing a whole bunch of people here who are my customers at my bakery how cool yeah. is that and but it for me it was the way that people spoke about how mm -hmm. to use your mind and the music the live music the live music like the a band an actual band like I grew up Ukrainian Catholic there was music in church but it was very reverential divine sacred liturgical music yes. there was no live band there was no dancing there was no laughing there was no having a good time there was reverence and respect for god and being in the presence of god and so here to be like oh my god i can go to church and dance and sing <laughs> that was, that was am and have fun that was amazing and and so for me that was relevant you know like i i can still walk into a ukrainian church i can still walk into a church of almost any kind um more like old typical churchy not like some of the newer ones with the the plushier chairs and and sound systems and whatever but i'm talking like wood incense stained glass that kind of stuff and just just it gives me goosebumps like i can thinking about it now i'm, I'm getting goosebumps because to me there's there's a connection that is just so strong there's no way that you know it's like it's in my soul but for me to actually engage and feel connected that live music and and the 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 power talk and then the main talk that reverend jonathan gave about you know what you talked about about how you know we are the ones who are in charge of our mind that we are the ones who create our reality and that we are the ones that are responsible for how we live our life when i first heard that it blew my mind wide open it was yes. like okay there's no master puppeteer or anything or any force or entity or anything outside of me that is determining how my life is unfolding I get to decide, I get to choose. And in fact, I'm always choosing every moment of every day, whether yeah. I'm doing it with awareness or not, whether I'm doing it consciously or otherwise. That was, that was just an amazing, amazing thing for me. And I'm so grateful that Glenn, you know, said, Hey, you know what I want to do next Sunday? I want to go to the center for spiritual living and that we went because that really was just a very pivotal moment in, in my life so there's more that I can expand on and maybe it'll come up later in the conversation but uh honey bunch is there anything that you want to chime in well, with here? I, I I find it kind of funny when you said that concept blew your mind because um you know while you're on your own journey you know I've been on my stop start journey of 
from a different perspective all, all of that those same principles but through the <clears throat> uh like patricia i was really big into the seth material and the mm. when i was young since since i was like 16 my sister gave me the a couple of the books and castaneda books and whatever but the the seth material that's their whole thing it's basically you create your own reality and you get what you concentrate on yeah. that's kind of it right <clears throat> um the, the so I would have my own kind of um, way of keeping a lid on that sort of knowing that stuff because it it no one talked about it like no one mm. people would think like okay especially since it's a channeled material stuff it's okay this ghost mm. is writing a book whatever but <clears throat> I think around the time that Lassie is talking about um, I picked up an Ernest Holmes kind of a c compendium or like a a compilation book and one of the titles was something like uh, the title of the book was something like you know um you know you can change your life or you can change your reality or whatever it was i'm so oh, that's like seth stuff so i kind of started reading that and then left it aside and then for some reason when last year's business was winding down I, I said let's go to the center for spiritual living and check this thing out <clears throat> um but yeah for me it's always been that um that like that uncertainty mixed with a deep knowing like i know this is mm -hmm. true but when you have everyone else saying no no no, there's only one reality and the, the, <laughs> you gotta like f find a way to fit into it you know yeah. and then you don't talk about the other stuff so so that was like my challenge and in terms of the um christianity element of those even those new thought churches um because I grew up in Northern Ireland in the in the seventies mm. um, uh, and in England, where it was like, it's just like it was a bad scene, uh, and it was very polarized. And it sort mm. of reminds me of right now. It's like you have to think this, or you have to think this, because you are born as this, and you stay this forever, and you're or you're this, you know. So, the evangelizing aspect of Christianity. Um, really turned me off like I, I just thought what's the point of religion when it, it doesn't make you feel good it makes you feel guilty and ashamed if you don't toe the line you know so to have these other types of ways of organizing a church or a community center based on spirituality and and uh growth consciousness learning to have them come along and, and sort of go oh no, no there's another way of doing it that we just you know we're not very ham-fisted about it we 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 honor you for just being here at this point in your journey whatever that is and i think unity of of vancouver island is a really good example of the the way that i wish it had been you know all along kind of thing because the you know as much as i would enjoy going into an anglican church for a service or a catholic church just to you know in in a funeral or a um a wedding or whatever it's like it has its own beauty but i know that dogma and the institutionalized kind of element for me is like it's like a wall it's like you you got to be on one side of this wall and you right now you're on the other side so that's fine you know just stay out come and visit it occasionally you know but to have an to have a a welcoming um just honoring come on in gathering kind of energy to a, a community and that can be any that can be like that can be like people getting together to read like a book group or something and mm -hmm. just to be with one another or meditation like Lassie does meditation every twice a month so yeah I, I know that you know this kind of stuff but I'm just giving you a background like yeah um, that I really this is one of the reasons I love the, the our own unity community but I know I would have walked into one in another part of the States or Canada. I might not feel the same way. I'm not sure, you know. I was interested in, in your reference to the Seth material and, and kind of apologized or dismissed that it's channeled. Yep. You know, ultimately, I think everything's channeled, you know, mm -hmm. all great music. Every, every talk I give on Sunday, I mean, I don't pretend that there's some other entity talking to me, but it's, it's, it's just coming through me. Right. You know, um, so that was one thing I thought of when you're to end. Um, 
they say when you talk about you know having your mind blown my just before i was introduced to new thought i did the est training which was the pre-runner to landmark education and i was i was in a bad state when i did that i was totally at the effect of a bad relationship blaming the men in my life for all sorts of things and just this hit upside the head when i realized that the only thing that was consistent in all my relationship was that i was in it right <laughs> Oh, um, so yeah, but you know, previous to that, I had felt totally at effect that life was just happening to me. There was nothing I could do about it. I was just being blown in the wind, as it were. And and this, as you say, this whole idea that I can actually change my thinking, change my life, that I can actually that my my thoughts and my belief are actually creative. I mean, it's the most empowering. And it was a difficult lesson. A lot of people are not in a position yet to hear it they just can't understand that no no look what's being done to me mm -hmm. but boy talk about liberation yeah yeah and that you know i think that goes to speak to something that glenn mentioned a few minutes ago a couple of times about honoring where you are on your journey honoring other people where they are on their journey um because i know for me i mean i this is my first year in five years that i'm not officially in class um in spiritual studies there's stuff that i'm doing still but this is a break this year mm -hmm. the first five years were intense and i know that you know next year or in come the fall yeah. when i go back into ministerial studies that that's probably going to be even more intense than advanced consciousness yeah. studies was last year so i'm grateful for the break um and it's been it's been interesting, you know, as I've been in class with people and, and teachers who I'm in for the last three years with Dr. James Mellon um, from the Global Truth Center Los Angeles, who is just so forward thinking, so cutting edge, so never mind outside of the box, there is no box um, thinking that it, the people he attracts into those classes, into his presence, into his community. It's just so amazing to be in the presence of people who are constantly wanting and, and actively being stretched and pulled apart <clears throat> and, and just like moving into the what's next and what's more and how can I just open myself up to this incredible, amazing, universal, energetic flow to consciousness to just like emerge itself through me in the most fulfilling, engaging, expansive way, still knowing there's always more to come, like always, 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 it's never stopping. It's always creating, it's always expanding. And so to be in that kind of environment for, you know, three years with Dr. James for two years before that in classes with various teachers, and then to step outside that in just sort of regular life um, can be challenging for me sometimes because I'm like, why isn't everyone wanting to do this? Why isn't everyone wanting to like, you know, live to their fullest potential and realize how incredibly innately powerful and creative they are. And, um, and it's less frustrating for me than, than it was when I first started my journey, because back then it was like, I want to share this with everyone. I want to tell this to everyone because everyone can benefit from it. And, and what I really came to realize is that my journey is mine. My journey is just for me and I get to live it and, and travel, you know, through it and experience it the way I choose. That's the same for everyone else. And everyone else is exactly where they are and they are exactly where they're meant to be. And for me now, I see that as an opportunity to not only honor, you know, where they are, but, but to sort of see how diverse and how different um, and how many different ways, like gazillions of different ways, consciousness just keeps emerging through and as everyone and everything. And I just, I find it fascinating and sort of the more, the more I experience that, the more even though I want to share it, the more I'm just curious about how can this happen through me? How can I become more of what I am meant to be, who I am meant to be? How is mine to show up in the world? And, and even though I'm so grateful for this break this year, because it's allowing me to focus more on my 
my soul excavation business and in working more with clients, um, I am so looking forward to getting back into school and having my mind and brain and just like the very, you know, isness of me pulled apart and blown to smithereens so I can get into, you know, the next the next version of myself to know that that's just going to be pulled apart and blown to smithereens, you know, five yeah. seconds later. Kind of thing. And that that's what's so scary for people, I think, yeah. you know, yeah. and you're right. I mean, we have to balance. We're yes, we're living in this world of our own that we create. And at the same time, we're living in a common reality that we've all created together yeah. and balancing that, that that's the difficulty, you know, re recognizing ourselves as the, just minute little thing in, in the scale of the universe looking up and, and seeing the stars and here's little me and at the same time knowing that all of that is contained within me yeah those those huge you know ends of the spectrum they're they're all within me yeah. how, how do we and how do we stop ourselves from getting so lost in this that we can't function in daily life and I think that's yeah. the fear for people yeah you know that and, and and just okay so daily life that's that's a good thing that i would love to focus on because i have been fortunate enough to also dip my toes into you know the csl pool and the unity or unity pool because i worked for unity victoria here for a year and a half and so not only did i see the wonderful wednesday morning groups that would come in with mavis um, as she facilitated the book studies and things that they talked about um, but I also got to see the behind the scenes and how the, you know, I worked in the office and to see some days better than others. And with some people, you know, more easier than with others, but how a, a church, um, is run in a very mindful, conscious and spiritual way. Um, and then be there for the transition from the way it was to more of the way it was before Unity Vancouver Island um, became what it is now. Mm -hmm. And and so to have that experience of um, applying spiritual principles to daily activities and to um, to moving through life and even a seemingly mundane task as bookkeeping or filing um, to, to find the joy and value and meaning in everything that I did and to see that happening, you know, in the board meetings. I mean, I attended some of the board meetings and those board meetings were amazing. They were, they were very different from other board meetings I had attended where people were honored and listened to and ideas were valued and, um, it just, it was a very different experience when something opened with an invocation or a prayer, knowing that everything that was meant to come forward, you know, with the, with successful solutions for all involved, you know, for the highest good of all involved was already making its way forward to begin from that versus, oh my God, we have to balance the budget was a very different experience. And, and so like seeing it in action in that setting, in addition to me having my daily practices, which really now, I mean, everything, everything is affirmative prayer. Everything I say, everything I do, I know that now it's, it's taken, you know, how, however long to get to that, but it's not just, you know, I meditate for half an hour. That's my spiritual practice at that time. I journal, I host meditation every other week, and that's my spiritual practice for that a lot of time. Life to me is spiritual practice. And, and the principles that are that are part of the unity teachings, that are part of the science of mind teachings, and I suspect part of other new thought teachings, <clears throat> where essentially we say, we teach that there is only one thing going on, you know, call it God, call it universe, call it source, call it energy, call it love, call it creativity, call it playfulness, call it what you will. There's only that one thing that is going on that is the activity, that is the essence, that is the inception, that is the interconnectivity of everyone and everything, which means that we are all that thing. And like you said, just a few minutes ago, the entire universe within us, you know, that Rumi quote, you are not just a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. 
And so to the extent that we're aware of that, <clears throat> we create our reality and we create our reality using our minds. So for me, I, I just, to see all of that put into practice daily and be able to apply that to how I do my work, to how I relate to people, to how I just show up in the world. To me, that's what these teachings are about, whether it's from unity, whether it's from science of mind, whether it's from something else, um, that's what it's about, is how, how would you respond to that, Reverend Patricia? Well, I, I, just before you said affirmative prayer, when you talked about starting a meeting with prayer, that was something I wanted to go to. And it's the kind of prayer that we do. Um, so we do, we start our meetings with a prayer. We end our meetings with a prayer. And it's not asking for something. Mm. It's it's accepting something. Yeah. It's it's setting the tone. It's knowing that that the the perfect answers and the perfect guidance is here. And uh, I was going to say thank you, but that's one of my pet peeves. Um, and, and many, many, many people. People and you thought I know end their prayers with something like thank you spirit um, I have a real this is personal to me a real um, antipathy towards putting using pronouns for God not him we all agree it's not a him mm -hmm. sometimes if we say it's a her I prefer to say it's an it if I have to use it yep. um, but the, the pr using saying thank you God to me in my mind conjures up a picture of God as a person mm -hmm. as a you as a person right mm -hmm. so um, we, uh, that was just a little side trip I took there well but, um, you we, know just just for that so I just want to interject just for a brief moment thank you was something that I was taught not to say because that uh, immediately put God outside of us yeah. That immediately it, it just it immediately separated and the whole thing that reverend jonathan and dr james who are two of my main teachers just like drilled into our minds is if you really believe and you really embody that you are god you are the infinite expanse of universe you will never use second person you will never refer and and even in um spiritual mind treatment always done in the first person never yeah. never 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 i will every now and then drop a thank you instead of saying i am grateful for because the right. feeling is there but uh yeah no that was like pummel the phrase that. thank you is just so ingrained in our culture it is the primary way we express gratitude so yeah. i i you know i realize i don't know everything and it's it's okay. And again, that's one of the things about new thought is that inclusivity. And it's, it, you know, we have to work at it. But the, the whole idea of, you know, when, when the gay rights started, I guess, 20 years or more ago, a lot of the uh, Christian churches be, um, took courses and they put up little signs to say that they were an affirming community. And to, to me, that's always been a non-issue. Yeah, um, and you thought it's of, of course you're welcome here. Yeah, if you look around, probably half of our ministers are gay. So mm -hmm. you know what's that all about? Um, it's just, it's not something we had to to say. It's yeah. something that that we acted, that we demonstrated out there. So in inclusivity, and and that is is especially important to me now. We say we're in inclusive, no matter what culture, no matter what sexuality. And it's kind of almost like sometimes everybody's welcome here, except people who are a bit of a nuisance. Yeah. You know, except people who have a little mental health challenge, except, except people who disrupt things a little bit. And, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves, are we inclusive? Is everyone welcome or not? And uh, yeah. And, yeah, and so that's just went through my head. That's how, however they pray, you know, however they, yeah. what position they take politically. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's... I I have I have a bit of a fix then. If, if yeah, uh, yeah. If your if your preference is to not use pronouns, um, mm -hmm. I mean my my pet peeve when it comes to almost every service or talk given is that it ends with Namaste, which mm -hmm. I understand the relevance and the powerful meaning in that phrase, but to me it's kind of kind of become a cliche mm. and i just think there if you if we are 
we are infinitely creative, mm -hmm. we should be able to find other ways to <laughs> to speak and and honor one another and honor God and what have you. But using different language, right? Um, my my suggestion for the pronoun thing is uh, just use one. Like one is grateful, as in we're all one. Mm. So, and grateful, like like we are. I mean, I'm using I'm using the game by saying we, but mm. one is my you know is my favorite one <laughs> because <laughs> because the um. Like even in the, in the, this is where I can't quite get on board with the the typical, as I understand it, typical, um, say Christian um, concept where you, you have like God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, right? I get that, but God, um, if God is omnipresent, then we are all it mm -hmm. and i think my understanding is people have the, a challenge with that part right they're like whoa there hold nelly what's going on like no no i need to pray to someone and i need to like have a personal relationship and even the whole idea of you know jesus christ as the personal savior of a person who, who, yeah. who claims to be who says i am christian because I've given up my life to, and I, I trust, put my trust in the, the, the person, I guess, the part of the Trinity, or if you're into mm. that, um, that is still like, well, you've distanced yourself again, right? You're not mm. in, embodying. And this is why the, the new, new thought church's idea of Christ consciousness, I don't know who came up with that, but that is a little bit more on my wavelength. You know, that's my, I can get that more. I don't, I don't necessarily have to um, put all my focus on the teachings of Jesus because I think this is a person who did exist in the Middle East, in a different culture, in a different time, and whose teachings, who, whose, whose um, experiences embodied what other people have looked at with, say, Buddha. It's like, okay, there's there's this way of being that is so open and trusting that you just you just know that like whatever happens is 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 fine because we really can't die because <laughs> energy can't die right it just changes so this I, this thing of 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 putting your your faith totally in one person who's separate from you and there's a story behind that you know father son and all that it's and i and i still don't understand how the feminine aspect became holy spirit rather than just father mother child you know i i'm still trying to f figure that part out but the other part of it that kind of gets me a bit riled up is um it's it's often swept aside that when Christianity came in and it, it, it really came in with like, like a storm, it completely, almost completely destroyed what was as in the pagan way of honoring life. You mm. know, like you have, I've said this before in the podcast, you have a, a Socrates or a Plato, or you have, um, you know, a, a, a someone like um marcus aurelius or you know people in those classical worlds they honored different gods for different aspects of life and that uh, and those things were were um those spirits were supposedly placed into into statues in temples you know and when christianity came in um that was all destroyed you know, and the yeah. Library of Alexandria destroyed by yeah. zealots, you know, people who just were like, no, we're not having any of that. Like, there's one way to look at life, yes. one way to honor God. And you guys are going to burn or you're going to, you know, we're taking all your temples and we're, we're going to turn them into a market or whatever. So all that stuff 
like we forget that that you know those ways of looking at life which which were different from the monotheistic way of 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 seeing god and life and our experience our uh relationship to god that was all kind of put aside but we we've kind of come around now when when we have you know let's say on vancouver island we have so many cultures that um in the first nations we have like we we've had um some Kwatan, um thomas's friend uh, lawrence mitchell come and speak with his children and and like give his story his way of honoring um life and experience and honor and um talking about mistakes and talking about learning and being with creator and all that stuff like that's that's sort of equivalent to what many pagan cultures were, were that was the day-to-day -day life of people they 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 honored um and made sacrifices to gods you know in the river in the trees in the rocks in the you know the the, the crops that were coming they would pray and that kind of thing um and i just think that whole thing has been kind of forgotten about you know mm -hmm. and it's interesting that it's kind of coming back because there's a there's a lot more um honoring or listening to indigenous cultures now like even from 10 years ago like <clears throat> we really didn't talk about these things and if you know if 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 you want to honor and be an ally like that's what it's about i think just listening and like but that also like there's parts of my culture that are in being in, from Northern Ireland, especially as a Protestant, born as a Protestant, but not really intense. Um, it, they, it was just trampled. Like it was just like we, the Irish were like one of the first cultures to be, um, to be colonized by Rome and all that. It was just like, okay, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> so that stuff, it's kind of broken. And I think it's important to let people find a way to, uh, include those and honor those pagan traditions back into their life as it is now because it's very different like i you know i can't just go to live in the irish countryside and go okay i am where i'm supposed to be because i i, I had this whole other 50 years of experience that is like yeah what do i forget about that stuff like you know so that's a ramble but back to one it is you covered a lot in the <laughs> The funny thing is, pagan used to be kind of a swear word, you know, yeah. and it still is to a lot of or Christians, heathen, yeah. especially. But it, it simply means the person who sees God in nature, you know. Yeah, yeah. A Cu couple of things that I picked up on the, from, the, from the beginning. That was a... a it was. Why <laughs> was your idea of, you know, accepting Jesus as the personal savior? And I always say, from what? Mm -hmm. What are we being saved from? And this is the whole sort of Christian idea of being born in sin okay yeah you know and i i used to work with uh, addicts quite a bit when i was in Kelowna. and just i worked with people who were in in recovery and, and were stable and we just have a conversation for an hour about the importance of having something spiritual in their lives you know and man so many people said for me where i find spirit is out in nature you know just yeah. so Another thing that I picked up on, and you said something was fine, and it triggered me to, with the thought that everything is important the, this, in our lives, the, you know, conscientious importance to every single detail. Mm -hmm. Everything we do, we need to do consciously because everything matters. And at the same time, in the big thing, scream of things, nothing matters mm -hmm. now, how do you that's very kind of buddhist i think and, and that, you know how do you balance that that your your attention is on you know right here but your intention is on is much bigger you know nothing really matters in the long scheme of things mm -hmm. those were just thoughts and i don't not sure how they they relate to what you just said but they went through my head as you spoke so Wow. Yeah. I've said enough for now. No. <laughs> well, no, what, just came up, what just came up for me, I mean, I'm loving listening to, to both of you talk. Um, 
is the attention versus intention and sort of like the focus versus the big picture. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the class favorite book that we read in advanced consciousness studies was the quantum revelation by Paul Levy. And in one of the chapters, he talks about versus like narrow focus and big picture and how you can't do both at the same time. And he talks about, I think it's a tapestry where you can like really hone in on one of the details and just marvel mm -hmm. at the craftsmanship and the thread and the colors and everything that's in there in this one little tiny part. Like, how did they do that? Or you can go out and see the entire scene, the entire mm -hmm. just, you know, magnificent, opulent, ornate display of this entire thing, you know, that has been woven together and experience that either way you're engaging in you know creativity um but it's like what are you gonna what are you gonna focus on on like the you know one tiny thing or the big picture that's kind of what that reminded me of because yeah for me i'm going back and forth constantly um you know like throughout the day and and again you know endeavoring to be mindful but there's also tons of stuff that I do where, you know, even though I'm aware that I'm doing it, I'm not, you know, focused on it because, mm -hmm. and, and so here's my question, because we actually talked about this in class and there's even the sort of, you know, where studies show that for about 5% of our waking day, we're thinking consciously, we're using our conscious mind and creating from our conscious mind. And the other 95% <clears throat> we're doing so by rote, we're doing so from those memories that you talked about yeah. at the very beginning of the podcast, from our subconscious mind. And the, for me, sort of the, the, not the trick, but the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The intention, I guess, is to balance the two to to what yeah. I am thinking consciously and what I'm what I'm doing and creating through my conscious mind um, becomes congruent or in alignment with my subconscious yeah. mind. So whatever limiting thoughts, stories, beliefs, the collective consciousness, race consciousness, whatever is, 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 you know, that subjective mind, that automatic filter or mirror for whatever mm -hmm. is, you know, being processed here, that because all of this, you know, I have come to terms with and have, have consciously decided, this is what I believe, this is what I'm creating from, that automatically whatever I think just filters through that mm -hmm. and shows up exactly the way that I expect it to, rather than, you know, being skewed and changed and shifted um, because of all of this muckiness that, that might be in my yeah. subjective mind. That might've been a bit too, too jargony. Um, but how, how do you do that? How do you, I mean, you're, you're, I feel like you're so far along on your journey, so far ahead of where I am, but how do you do that on a daily basis? Maybe even a moment to moment basis is, yeah. It, it, it never ends. I mean, uh, I still have dark nights of the soul all the time. Mm. Sometimes they last for 30 seconds. Sometimes they last for a day or two. Yeah. And, you know, I don't believe anything anymore. I better resign. I better quit. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're constantly working on it. And as you say, the, the more, just over the years or whatever, the more we get conscious about what we're thinking and knowing that that's going into our subconscious mind. Well, the old analogy, if you have a glass of muddy water and you just, you know, keep dropping clear waters into it, eventually that water clears. So you just mm -hmm. have to keep... And, and you really can't can't access your subconscious. I don't know, don't know much about psychology, but my conscious mind can train my subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's where we have to work. Yeah. Noticing. Oh, oh, there I go again. <gasps> Noticing. Heidi Munch, that was your word last week, wasn't it? Noticing. Yeah. 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 We last week we had on um, a returning guest, uh, Emily Rogers, who also talked a little bit about uh sorry th the noticing thing was like where i'm at that's where I, that's when we all discuss where we're what we're kind of doing mm -hmm. uh and for me it was like i'm in a noticing phase of everything because there's so much going on in the world right mm -hmm. uh, but emily's uh emily is an amazing sort of philosophical mind um and philosophical we actually psychology student yes 
and when we met her, she was living in Nanaimo. She's now since moved to um, the mainland. And she and her husband are both uh, doing this landmark um, training thing. So that, like, my ears pricked up when she was talking about that. You said it began as Est in the, I guess, the late 60s? Is that when that thing started? Or? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe 70s. I did it in 1979, and it was relatively new then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it sounds pretty intense. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. That's uh, it's like the the amount of sort of discipline involved, and just being. My, I guess it's a it's a it's a tool, a toolkit to do that training of the mind and like be. It's it's the. Uh, four agreements, you know, be impeccable with your word, but like always do your best. And it's like that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm really intrigued by that kind of thing, but it's, it, to me, it sounds like right now I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go anywhere near something that's going to take that much time. Mm. Uh, <laughs> well, and it's also being held accountable. Right. Okay. And that's, that's, I mean, who yeah. wants to be held accountable? Really? <laughs> Yeah, change the subject quick. That's uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, it, it's 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 yeah. We're back to the noticing thing, but it, it. I'm really see. This is one of the things where it's when I started with Unity when it was Unity Victoria, um, and we we're in that similar position. Many sir, many uh, communities have of like, well, we don't have. A full-time minister we don't have a leader in that way um we do we do have this amazing infrastructure of like uh that volunteer pool availability and last has already mentioned the wonderful mavis and that kind of like getting people just to think about like these these concepts and these these teachings but to bring in their own experience you know and but for me it's it was like a weird time to come into a, a, a community where that was going on but also when the covid stuff was happening um there was like a bit of a panic going on but it was also this core sort of belief that you know all is well you know and we as we like i was on the board then and we'd have this this uh this kind of focusing our energy on that 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 knowing that yeah all is well like you know we are prosperous and all that kind of stuff and when, as we gradually um combined the comox valley and the unity nanaimo and unity victoria into this new organization that is almost coming up to a year old i guess um the, i started to sort of realize like okay it's interesting that our even though it may not be the same for everyone in that community, this community is, is a very, um, it is like a high frequency of like, like well being and it's prosperity consciousness is like way up there, you know? And it's interesting to be in that, that position where, um, it's like, it's like a real, um, you, you, you just sort of, it's like relaxing and knowing that it's all, it's all taken care of. Like, you know, everything's, going really well and whatever challenges we have we're, we've got it that's fine you know it's just a weird thing and you're you're kind of in that um sort of i don't want to say figurehead but you're in that sort of front and center position um, and thomas is doing his um you know last year i guess of ministerial so we're in good shape i guess mm -hmm. we are. um and then you're also doing the Unity Canada thing, which you just recently took on. And it's, you know, I, I, I just wonder, like, when people, um, when they sort of say I'm too busy, I, I kind of want to point them out, like, have you seen what Patricia's doing? There? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on, you know? Like, it's like, it, when I, last I gave me this this morning, this is your bio, and she printed it out, and it's like, you know, look at all this space that's available for, because Patricia's got a whole bunch of other things that she's going to do. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just just that I get bored easy. That's all. <laughs> and as, as I learned the other day, a lot of the time in meetings, like under the table, she's knitting. It's like, oh, OK, like, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> it's 
I'm not doing industrious. that today. You see how important you are to me? <laughs> being industrious as well, you know. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, it's like maybe this is a bit of a pitch for the for the uh Unity Vancouver Island, but sure like, sounds it like it. <laughs> and yeah, and you know, I think it's all about and that's what I think is wrong with the world today is so many people don't have a sense of purpose. You know, and you know, especially if you get to my age and you know, most of my friends have been retired for years. And you know, what do we do? And there's no it's just don't want to use the term waiting to die, but in a way that's what it is, you know. Um so yeah. Well, my talk tomorrow, I'm closing with a quote from George Bernard Shaw, who's my favorite author of all times. And he's the one who said, you know, I, I just, I want to be thoroughly used up before yeah. they throw me on the trash heap, you know. Um, and, and you know, not everybody chooses that and that's fine, you know. Yeah, that, it, it, it reminds me, as you said, um, waiting to die. There used to be a BBC TV show, um, one foot in the grave remember this show no with Vic victor meldrew and he spent his whole time looking out the window and like pointing what is that idiot doing over there like it was his whole life was just you know and yeah. his catchphrase was i don't believe it you know it was whatever was going on it was so like right sit there and judge the rest yeah, of the world all the time and his wife yeah. was just like okay yeah or, or worry about your health and i mean i'm blessed that i have good health i don't know how i'd be you know, but so many people as they get into retirement age and beyond living in a constant state of not quite fear, but tension about, you know, is this the day? Is my yeah, body well, okay? You know, and, and it's, it's, that's that thing of, you know, I think we've all been there at some point of once you start noticing dis-ease, like you really, it catches your attention and you focus mm -hmm. on it and it just yeah. gets, it just kind of builds and builds. And, you know, Lass is in this position where she's able to um almost on a daily basis rem be reminded she she works in a um uh amazing uh chiropractor's office mm -hmm. and the best last year you can explain it from here but it's like you've it's a gift where you get to work you know yeah Wonderful. no it is i thought you were actually going to talk about the work that i do but anyway <laughs> Okay, so yeah, no, I do. I work, I work part time in a chiropractic clinic, and the main technique that Dr. Christina, who actually uh, did a podcast with us last year, Dr. Christina Clapham, if you want to check it out, uh, the acronym for it is BEST, which is stands for Bioenergetic Synchronization Technique, and it is completely different than what most people will imagine when they hear the word chiropractor, because there's no crunching or manipulating of bones in any kind of severe way. It's very gentle, it's very non-invasive, and it, it basically is about Dr. Christina asking the body questions and the body giving her the answers. And as the body gives her the answers, then she works with the body to clear the interference, the limiting thoughts, beliefs, stories, traumas that have been trapped in the body for, you know, anywhere from like since last night to before you were born in yes. utero, uh, generational, what collective consciousness about, you know, COVID, um, that gets released so that the body can come back into alignment into its natural state of alignment until the next time and then you know people come back and you know do, does more of this technique and it is amazing and i mean i came to her as a patient because about 12 different people through csl victoria had had gone to see her and just loved her and when they talked about the kind of work that she did i'm like well, this kind of sounds like if science of mind were chiropractic, mm -hmm. that it would mm -hmm. kind of maybe be a little bit like that. And when I sat down for my initial consultation, just within five minutes, I'm like, okay, I'm on board. This is amazing. Especially when she talked about having studied with Dr. Joe Dispenza and Bruce Lipton. Oh, yeah. And it was like, okay. Yeah. I'm here. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in thinking I'll go to see her once or twice and I'll be done. Well, two years later, <laughs> Not only am I still a patient, but I am also working there. And for me, I mean, it's almost like this is this is spiritual practice in another mm -hmm. way. It is continually just clearing away those limiting thoughts, beliefs, stories, traumas that 
haven't been keeping us feeling stuck that we have insisted on holding on to. And now this is an opportunity for us to let go so that we can open our hands to receive, you know, or allow that, you know, energetic universal flow, consciousness, God, light, love, whatever you want to call it, to flow freely and just express through and as us every moment of every day. So it's, it's just, it's an amazing place to be because she attracts people, some people more than others who really are interested in improving their quality of life, um, who are really taking an active, like participating actively in their health and well-being. <clears throat> some are still, when they come in, they're like, what can you do for me? What can you mm -hmm. do to make me feel better? But, but my experience so far after having been there about a year and a half is that most people who walk through there at some point realize that, oh, there's more than I can do in order to help myself. And, you know, the more I do that, then the more these treatments that I get from Dr. Christina are valuable and it just one feeds into the other. Yeah. Um, and then that also just reminds me of what I thought Glenn was going to be talking about. <laughs> which is the work that I do, which actually I'm doing a workshop um, at, at Unity Vancouver Island coming up next month on the 10th is the Eat Well, Be Well work, which is, which is about improving our quality of life, not just by choosing different foods because the foods themselves are going to help us, you know, to feel better and become more vibrant and energized and get rid of inflammation and the achiness and the joints and in our back and, and, you know, are preventing us from sleeping well, but it's about the awareness that we have around food. It's about the mindfulness and the activity of what nourishment is not just through food, but also all the other ways that we nourish ourselves in our life. Um, you know, are we, are we actively participating in that? Are we aware of how we're nourishing ourselves or are we doing things that are making us feel tired and like we have no energy and like there isn't enough time or money to do anything and that we're basically just, you know, waiting to die because we're getting old and that's just what happens when you get old, things start to break down and you get sick and eventually everyone's going to get cancer and die. So <clears throat> There, there are many different ways of, of looking at it and any moment in time, like the now moment, like that's when you get to change stuff, like right now, right now, right now. And because the universe is constantly rebooting itself, we're constantly being rebooted, we're rebooting ourselves. Every single moment is a brand spanking new opportunity to go, I'm going to do something different now. I'm going to choose to get uncomfortable and get out of my comfort zone and try something different because maybe that will get me, you know, feeling better. Maybe I won't feel as achy or tired. I'll have more energy, whatever, but it'll be different than what I've experienced up until now. And I think the teachings are just so key in, in allowing people to realize you have that choice every moment. Like you can choose something different anytime. Unity was founded on healing. That's what it was about originally. Both Charles and Myrtle female, Fillmore had, <laughs> uh, Myrtle had had chronic tuberculosis for many years and, and Charles has had a, a withered hip and a shortened leg from an accident. And they were both healed through retraining their mind. I, I have a personal story that I think is really down to earth. And, Many years ago, I had a very small cancer on my kidney. And so we made arrangements to you know, do surgery and nip it off. And part of the pre-surgery um, screening was a chest X-ray. And just after I had my chest, chest X-ray, I had a call from my doctor's office saying, uh, the doctor would like to see you. Well, right away, it's like bad news, right? And the thing is they gave me an appointment like two weeks later so I had two weeks where I had to wait for this bad news. And what I knew was that the uh, kidney cancer metastasizes to the lungs, first of all. And so I'd had this chest X-ray and a call back to my doctor. And I started wondering, you know, are my lungs okay? And then I started thinking, oh my goodness, you know, come to think of it. There's this little, you know, here and, and these pains in the two weeks 
got worse and worse. So by the time I got to the doctor's office, I was absolutely convinced that she was going to tell me it had metastasized to my lungs. When I got there, she said, oh, thanks for coming in. She said, I just wanted to ask you to write a letter to the government saying how bad it is that you had to wait eight weeks for kidneys for cancer surgery. Wow. The pain disappeared yeah. instantly. <laughs> this incredible he <clears throat> power of the mind to make us sick and to heal us, you know. And yeah. you're, it's funny, last you mentioned the word comfort, comfort zone. Isn't that your service thing tomorrow? Affliction of comfort? Isn't that your... Yeah, the affliction thing? of comfort. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfort. <laughs> <laughs> Taking that to a whole new level tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yep. The power of the mind in action. Yeah. yeah. I have so many stories of that. Really, when you get, and again, look, looking at the... Well, and you know what? I mean, I, I, that's what I think people can relate to. People relate to stories. And when, mm. when someone hears something like that, I'm thinking that someone who listens to this podcast is going to go, whoa, and, you know, will resonate on some level and, yeah. and will stir something in them to realize that, oh my gosh, you mean that just because I've been living life like this up until now doesn't mean it has to be like that going forward? No. No. Just a, like another, I was four years old. And uh, I was working with my father. We were going to move into a new house. And, oh, it had a coal chute into the basement and stuff. We we're clearing stuff out of the basement. And there was a bushel basket full of refuse there. And sticking out of the bushel basket was a big piece shard of broken glass. And I reached down to pick up a paper underneath it and have a, a four-inch scar on my arm. I was four years old. So, yeah, you, damn, you cut my arm off. But what I remember from that is my father taking off his shirt, wrapping my arm up, carrying me to the doctor's, walking into the doctor's office, and the lady stood up and said, you can go right in. You know, and there was all this attention from my father, which yeah. was rare. Yeah. And I started cutting my body, hmm. you know, it, with accidents and with, I had, you know, by the time I was 27, I'd had four major surgeries. And looking back, and I say, oh, my God, I discovered that the way to get attention was to cut my body. Mm -hmm. And it seems so, so bizarre and so far out, but a little four-year-old mind puts those things, you know. Yeah. And, and I don't mean to spend, you know, months going into therapy and stuff. But when you, when you just realize those connections, you can, you can grab hold of it and, and make things change, you know. Yeah, Lassia has her own story about glass, but uh, anyway, uh, you can disguise. It's, it's, you can put that in, in. It's in the book, isn't it? The, yeah, it is. <clears throat> yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm going through my book revisions right now. They're due. The manuscript is due on April first, and so I'm on the second third of my book. Um, so that's what this weekend is about. But yeah, in the first part of the book, among the main vignette, um, there are little tiny ones, and there is one about me being three tracing my finger just being absolutely fascinated by this s curve that was a break I, I don't know how an s curve but an s break in the glass one of those old this was when i was three so 1971 so the glass was this like rippled long mm. pane and just looking and the sunlight dappling through and glimmering and shimmering and me just taking my finger and just tracing the s cutting my finger in the process, but not realizing because I was just so fascinated that, right. you know, this light was happening and dancing in the curve and whatever. And then my dad coming in to the hallway, freaking out, wrenching my hand away, screaming, you know, and how could I be so stupid to do something like that? And it was only then that, you know, realized that, oh, my finger is bleeding profusely because I had cut it on the glass. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, you know, a whole other stuff, you know, from there, but it was just like, I was focused on the glass and the beauty and, and the, you know, just like the sparkly shimmeriness. My dad was like, Oh my God, my child is bleeding to death kind of thing. So, and you made yeah. conclusions in your little mind yep. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so fast forward, guess who always cleans the windows in the house in, in our household? <laughs> Useful. <laughs> <laughs> You got something out of it. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, yeah, the the, but the other thing about this whole, like, I, I absolutely acknowledge that it is uh, a real thing that you have things like, um, generational trauma, right? Mm. You have intergenerational sure. trauma, and it's it's real. However, I think the power of the other side of that coin is 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 all is always is often like forgotten about or just played down this idea and this is back to the seth material stuff it's like look this is a story this is real in that story this is very real um but the other part of it is the generational tr trauma thing it's like when you when you pull back and look at it from the perspective of even of say like um the uh, epigenetics and bruce lipton stuff right it's like you can train you can refocus your energy within your consciousness in your body in your mind and you're you are able to like you're just reprogramming your body all the time you know mm -hmm. whether you know it or not and because there's really not there's no time time doesn't really exist it's just a, a an agreed upon framework that makes it easier to discuss things and and just be in society you know um but there isn't actual time it's like you you stop and start everything in the moment right so so really you're you're for example in the current uh early march 2020 um it's the war they what is mm -hmm. war you know it's sort of a thing that's in your life if you're in a certain part of the world or it's on the news or it's in the future it could happen it could affect me <clears throat> and your your decision of how much attention you place place on that will actually mold your experience yes. going forward right um so you know again it's it's sort of a it doesn't necessarily translate well because you know the minute you start talking about like how do i put that into practice well it involves time it involves um uh discipline and just you know recognizing the examples of how you can actually make little changes in your life that that benefit you that are beneficial to you and to others by just like not necessarily even getting involved in a conversation that seems like important on one level but really it's a choice to do so and to to not get involved in the conversation or just just to listen and leave it at that that is often the best thing to do that is a, a form of healing by mm -hmm. just like just being there and listening you don't you don't have to insert yourself as a character into that story right so you know back to the um generational trauma thing um i i can acknowledge that um my even my parents when they whatever experiences they were going through when when i was born when i was conceived mm -hmm. um that's part of who i am mm -hmm. but it's not the only story that i'm you know destined to you yeah. know it's like no like look how many times in our lives we've changed you know and we've say had a bad relationship with another person and been able to walk away from it after hitting your head against the wall a certain number of times or just realizing like this is not healthy or good for either of us here like let's just yeah. go you know um so that we have to remind ourselves like this is this is an ability we all have because it's like you stop and start time you you my it's on my bulletin board here every moment is a starting point for creation like you're you're inventing the universe like each moment right mm -hmm. and it's happening so rapidly it's it's continuous it's like a film is like 24 frames per second you, you just think it's well no it's actually little moments you know so this is like for me it's like uh it's a conundrum it's like i i get the 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 trauma thing but again there's a part of that is that is a choice and that we can mm -hmm. pull back and like honor like i when last i was doing the meditation uh last week um whatever she was doing she was using the mark nepo book um what's it called 
<clears throat> 7,000 ways to listen. Yeah. And whatever imagery was going on, it had me being held by my mother as a baby. I'm, I'm babe in arms kind of thing. And I was in this like real, like relaxed state. And then within moments, I'm holding my own mother as a baby. A whole, I'm, I'm giving love to my mother, right? And then my father, which is even more surprising because I thought, what's going on here? Like my father like was very not involved with the lives of his children. <laughs> he was there, but he wasn't there. And to have like an opportunity, as I see it now, to be able to go like, oh, you know, this is this is a a, a a tiny being who is so full of potential, and I get to, in just an instant, just a moment, to just hold this person who is my father, and then this other person who is my mother. And obviously there's that cycle thing because I'm I'm also held in another image, but I was like, mm. I felt this love of being a parent of you know, what what is God? Like part of God is there. And and it's and this this um it was so it was so like moving to me. And then I came out of it and was explaining to the other people there. It was, it was very um like shocking. <laughs> And I had that opportunity. It wasn't like just a little dream flit, flitting um, moment of a dream you remember. It was very visceral and real. But it, I don't know how long it lasted, but I'm so glad I had the opportunity. So thank you. Last, again, that was, yes, cool. Yeah. You talk about the um, the generational trauma and, and how one can make it a choice not to... But the trick for that and everything else really is before you have the choice, you have to notice it. You have to know what it is you're doing before you can choose to stop doing it. And, that, and that's the whole reason for therapy and all the various processes we go for is to, to notice what it is and then we can make the choice. Yeah. So Reverend Patricia, just, just to clarify for me, when you're saying noticing, are you noticing that we are making the choice? Possibly, yes. I'm noticing that we're, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm So for instance, I'm cutting my body a lot because it gets me attention. Yeah. But I have to bring that into my consciousness before I can say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the thing that or I I'm at the effect of. I'm a, the effect of my culture. Yep. Do I like that? Shall I keep it? Yeah, maybe, but not yeah. this part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing that was coming up for me, um, as both of you were speaking, is my absolute favorite spiritual principle. Principle is not bound by precedent, precedent <clears throat> by Thomas Troward that was used by Ernest Holmes. And, um, and it means that there is, so precedent is something that happened principle is who and what we are that universal energetic flow consciousness god whatever whatever works for you so principle is not bound by precedent means that there is nothing that has ever happened that could ever have any bearing on the infinitude the infinite creativity power and resilience that you innately are that is unchangeable yeah. Um, it's forever changing, but that in itself as a concept is unchangeable. Yeah. Now, when I was in the advanced consciousness studies class and we were diving into quantum physics, that principle expanded even further for me because of this whole universe being rebooted, you know, and every moment is literally a brand spanking new now moment, because it means that nothing that has ever happened, nothing that could happen has any bearing on who and what you are and how infinitely creative and powerful and resilient you are. So when Glenn, you were talking about the generational trauma um, and it just totally tied in, you know, with or, or Reverend Patricia just totally tied it in for me was that we're choosing to drag that or that, you know, like something that happened or something that, that we're worrying about that might happen into the present moment and that we're like experiencing in that moment, not what happened or what could happen, but the idea or the, you know, the memory or the anticipation of 
the event that isn't even happening in this moment. And that's what is causing our pain, our frustration, our anxiety, or, the, or not, I don't even want to say are, but the frustration, the anxiety, the depression, whatever it is that we're feeling emotionally, physically in that moment, it's not the thing. It's our interpretation. It's our perception. It's our relationship to the thing. And, and for me, just where I am, I feel like the the challenge knowing that like for the last year and a half one of the things that i have been experiencing myself is um pain and discomfort in my left knee and to the point where there have been some days where i haven't been able to bend it i haven't been able to walk comfortably on it tears knowing that i can i am i am responsible for how i'm experiencing this but just some days not knowing what to do and some days like, you know, just please somebody help me. Um, but, but also knowing that when I choose like, okay, this is not the reality that I want to experience. I know that consciousness is perfection. And as I, you know, if, if I really truly embody that I am consciousness expressing, I'm not going to be experiencing pain in my knee. I'm not going to be thinking about that, focusing on it, whatever. So so over the past year and a half, there, it's been ebb and flow and ebb and flow and ebb and flow. And right now I am in a flow of a few weeks of just being incredibly mindful with my diet, taking out all anti-inflammatory foods, not doing strenuous exercise, like leg presses of 400 pounds, knowing that it's going to strain my knee, um, being more careful how I sit, being more mindful how I walk, which shoes I wear, like making choices every moment, knowing that the choice that I make is affecting my experience of my body. Um, and for the last couple of weeks, just feeling so much better and easy and breezy to the point of yesterday being the freest that I like the most expansive that I have felt my knee in a year and a half. And it's yes, I mean, I'm going for chiropractic treatment. And yes, I'm going for acupuncture. However, I'm making the choices to go for chiropractic treatment to go for acupuncture, and then in between to do all the things that I'm doing, and choosing to believe that those things are supporting me in living pain free and feeling the vibrancy and energy and comfort and fluidity and movability and flexibility of this super awesome body that I have, that is an expression of consciousness. Um, so that's, uh, and that, that is a combination for me, which is what I was getting to of, of living sort of in a Newtonian, you know, or a scientific materialistic world while being aware of the quantum, you know, realm and, bringing it together, knowing that I don't have to stay stuck in this kind of reality that I can grab from, you know, the realities where this isn't even an issue. I'm like doing other stuff and dancing and skydiving and, and surfing and whatever. Um, that's what I'm focusing on, which is helping me to make the choices I'm making in the now moment to feel better. Does that Makes sense. Yes. And I, and I was just thinking of um, Myrtle Fillmore. She healed her body by talking to it, by talking to her cells. And <clears throat> I actually uh, broke uh, just a, a very thin fracture of the plateller plateau or something. Anyway, I broke my knee. Um, and I, I massaged it several times a day. And I just felt every little bit of the bones in there. And I thanked my knee and I and I talked to it and you know just rubbed it and paid attention to it and and talked to the ligaments and the this and that and and just you know how I, I love a massage yeah so I was massaging myself too you know and most people didn't even know I had broken my leg yeah you know for a couple of weeks I was a little bit but and, and that's that is so and, it, and it's free and it's available to everybody to talk to your body, to listen to your body, you know, because it's, it's all on. It's all one holistic, the mind body connection. Yep. I'm curious to see um, with Lassie, with your, uh, you know, first time in a little while you've done a, um, a talk and a whatever and, and it in a church setting, but I'm curious to see what benefit that people at the service or 
the who come uh, get out, get out of that. It's, it can only be good as far as I'm concerned. But <clears throat> Sorry, uh, what are you talking about? Just your well, you're gonna you're gonna be doing your eat well, be well thing. Oh so, right, yes, yeah, and I mean the re one of the reasons that I'm excited to do it in. Um, in Nanaimo, you know, for Unity Vancouver Island, whoever is interested there, is because people already there on some level are aware of this mind body connection. People oh, yes. already are aware of how powerful and creative they are. What's interesting to me with my spiritual community here versus, say, my spiritual community in Los Angeles is the embodiment of resilience and really, 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 you know focusing on the resilience aspect and the creative aspect versus this is what's happening. Uh, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing. And, and then again, you know, just sort of like the beliefs of, well, you know, I'm in my seventies, I'm in my eighties. This is just a part of life. This is what happens. We're just talking about not feeling well or or the, di the latest diagnosis or how many covid cases um you know have been talked about in the news that the the resilience to me is is just something that really could use a little bit more you know attention a lot of tlc and just a lot of noticing frankly because as everyone here has talked about today, what we put our attention on is what grows, you know, what we focus on expands. And so if we are thinking and embracing and embodying, um, you know, our resilience and how powerful and creative we are and like, what else can I do versus, oh, my back hurts and oh, my joints ache. Well, which way are you going to maybe get, you know, feeling better? So yeah, so I'm excited because I know that people are already like primed, you know, to some degree and they're aware. So yeah, so that it just, there's, there's just more to do in, in that kind of yeah. environment. So yeah. And that brings up a question a lot of people have about new thought. Um, and are we, are we the same as Christian science? And, you know, in the basic teachings, yes, almost the same. And the two main differences are Christian science teaches only the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy, where yeah. we're open, like we study everybody. Yeah. And and Christian Science will will um, not cooperate with the medical profession. They said, you know, they're committed to I can heal myself, and I respect that. But to the extent that we're being swayed by the common misconceptions that we that illness is inevitable and we need antibiotics and this and that. To the extent that we that that's true for us, we'll then use that. Yeah, use that with your knowledge that your body naturally its natural state is healthy, and you can can return to that. But if if you believe that you need the doctor to set your leg, you better go see the doctor. Yeah. Know? So um, new thought. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. No. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, it's this. If God is everywhere and all powerful, God is at work as the surgeon, as the chiropractor, as the, as Lacia, as Glenn, as me, you know, we're all uh, healing channels. Yeah. In the supplements, in the medicine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's uh, and that word belief, believe and belief. That's <clears throat> exactly. That's the linchpin, isn't it? Because when, when I, you know, have a discussion with someone at work and I realize we're on polar opposites of an, perspective um i have to remind myself well because that person that's what they believe they're experiencing what they believe so and that's true for them i i come along with my beliefs and it's like well they <laughs> they're not the same <laughs> so that's fine you know um i i've got my own life and my own evidence that what i see and what i feel and experience is right it's what's going on but it's according to my programming same for that person yeah, yeah. You know? so it's almost a bit of a miracle that we we actually are able to have these spaces where and and these opportunities where we so-called agree to disagree but it's almost like just honoring the fact that this person's journey and this well again the belief thing it's like they they're not on literally on the same page as me i'm just i'm over here and they're over there and who's right 
Well, we both are because we're yes. both. <laughs> we're, we're so addicted to being right. And we think that in order to be right, we have to make somebody else wrong. Yeah. And neither is true. You know. when, when, when in our early days, you know, we were going through stuff, Lassie and I, and one of my things that came out of my mouth one time, and I, I don't know, I obviously heard it somewhere or whatever, but it's, I just, she was adamant about something. And I just said, look, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be friends? And, <laughs> and that was like, we both kind of laughed. And it's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's, that's kind of our icebreaker. I know other people who would say, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? Um, but for us, it's, do you, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be friends? And um, yeah, it's a, it's a good one to, I mean, I, I we haven't had to actually use it in a while. <laughs> Cause we're but, good friends. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it could be like a really heated argument or like I'm, you know, and Glenn is just, <laughs> and then one of us will say, and then it just, it does, it completely, you know, shift in perspective, bringing back, you know, into alignment and, you know, what's, what's true and good. And we can both agree that, yes, we yeah. always want to be friends <laughs> <laughs> as long as I'm right. <laughs> no, <laughs> Always the last word, yes. No, yes. that's our daughter, Milana. <laughs> but there's there's room for so many truths, you know. Yeah. That's that's I think that's peculiar to Western culture somehow. The right wrong, maybe not. I don't know. Well, no, I don't know. Like this is where like our, our friend uh Dave back in Toronto, um from Israel and you know, getting into arguments with him really taught me, it's like, wow, a person could be so like throw all their essence into an argument and then it just, it just dissipates. It's like, it's, it, there's a, there's a certain uh, cultural uh, norm in, in certain societies where it's just like, it seems from the outside, it's like, well, this, this is going to come to blows at any moment, you know, but really it's just like, no, then you, you you give it your all but like it's you know uh you move through it you have to move through it with the energy of giving giving it your all you know mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know if it's you know maybe again i don't, i'm not well traveled but it's i'm sure there are little pockets uh well again is it is it more as you say as a western thing um I don't know. It's it's. I'm getting lost in this, but it's like <laughs> I should just I should just do what it says behind you. Peace, be still. I'll just be quiet. Peace. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And this wonderful. This this picture is the same. It's a duplicate of the picture that's in the um, the little chapel at Unity Village where the Fillmores used to pray. Right. Wow. And somebody donated this to unity vancouver island years ago it was in the main building and uh, now that's mostly daycare so it's been brought over to my little study meditation library here yeah. so kind of cool aren't i lucky yeah yeah okay so i'm looking at the time and we've gone past 10 30 which we're endeavoring to sort of cut things off at because our podcast can just go <laughs> for hours um there are a couple of things that you mentioned at the beginning though that i was really curious about and was wondering if you could expand on so i'll pick one um and well you know what i'll give you two and then you can pick one so one okay. of them was that um, a couple of your aspirations are to be an Aboriginal ally and the other one is to be an addict supporter. And mm. so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about either one of those, what that means for you. Okay. Well, um, I had a daughter who lived with addiction for about 16 years. Um, some of those years living with me, a couple of major hospitalizations, several trips to the emergency where we found her, you know, gave her CPR, brought her back, um, and eventually um, it got her. Uh, so that's, that's important. And I see how, how major a problem this is in our society. And even when I watch TV, you know, people are just doing drugs all the time. It's such a thing. And even now, um, the opioid crisis is taking more lives than COVID, you know, has throughout the whole thing. 
Um, and yet, and it affects mostly young people who have, you know, a lifetime of potential ahead of them. And so I wonder, and yet, you know, with COVID, which is affecting mostly old people, and we put so much energy into it, I, I just wonder what's lacking, um, that somehow we feel that, that it's the addict's own fault, um, that it's a choice they've made, and that, it, you know, it, it needs to be treated as a disease. I like the idea of that's been uh, tried in, in Portugal and other places where you give the addict what they need to remove the criminal activity of having to steal to get it. Mm -hmm. And then when they have what they need, you can start to treat them. That just makes some infinite sense to me. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a, a major threat to our society that we're just kind of sweeping under the rug. Um, I don't know what I can do, but I know it's an area that I'd like to see some change in. Mm. Wow. Okay. You know, the thing is, and I often think too, if, if your 20 something child came to you or, or the doctor told you they had cancer, you would do anything. Yeah. You'd drop everything. You'd sell the house. You'd drive them to, you know, this equally life threatening disease. We kick them out you know yeah. just yeah some there's something fishy here so okay so this is this is a, a very personal thing for you clearly yeah. and it's not something that i can relate to um because it's not something i have a lot of personal experience with um i'm going to ask you a question which for me asking it is a little uncomfortable but you just talked about you know that some people think that it's a choice that they have made and we spent some time talking about that we're always choosing and we're always at choice to what it is that we want to focus our attention on. And so whether it's from your personal experience with your daughter or sort of anything else that came of that experience about addiction, is there something that you that you feel or or can maybe offer? as to, you know, as, as a mother of, of, you know, someone who did die um, as a result of addiction, is there something that you can offer to another parent or someone who has someone in their life who's experiencing this as to how to navigate? Um, because even those people, you know, the parents or the siblings or the friends or whoever it is that, you know, is in relationship with the person who is dealing with addiction, um, they're choosing and how to respond to that, that person. So is there something that you would like to offer to people? I don't know. It's really tough. I know when I was in Kamloops, I did go to some government sponsored, um, parents care or families care, I think, uh, you know, sort of group therapy session. Yeah. Um, and it was really only about protecting yourself Mm -hmm. from the effects of the addiction of someone else and right. that that didn't sit right for me yeah um, I don't know you know looking back now I think the only thing I would have done differently is I would have sold everything mortgaged the house in order to put her into a really good rehab program yeah um but you know if she wasn't ready yeah um it, I don't know I don't know what the end there is, I mean, most, most addicts, are, it's pain they're covering up. Yeah. Um, and, and I suppose going into therapy and, and finding that is helpful, but again, it's, it's a choice. Yeah. Ultimately it's a choice on the person affected. And, and I guess really this teaching is the answer to that too. Yeah. It, if they could, when they go into rehab, if they could come to us, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Um, supporting them but not enabling them there's, there's a huge difference there yeah. you know um it's really really it's as hard it's a disease that affects the family as much as the addict yeah yeah mm -hmm. just we need more awareness and more commitment from the government i guess to i don't know if i do know i'd have done it by now right well, that here's here's a question. I mean, you talked about how the opioid, and I'm, I've heard this before. Other people have said this too, so it's not just you saying this. That the opioid crisis um, is taking more lives, or responsible for more deaths than COVID. Yeah. So why are we choosing? Why are we as a collective 
because I know maybe not the individuals here, but like the collective consciousness, why is the collective consciousness choosing to focus on COVID so much rather, which is sort of, I don't want to say fleeting, but like everything, it has come to pass, but the opioid crisis has been going on for much longer. So why are we choosing to focus or why did we, you know, and then like a couple of weeks ago, the collective consciousness, you know, focus eyeball switch to Ukraine and what's happening in Ukraine. Yeah, mm -hmm. right here at home, there's this thing happening um, where we could actually, if we put our attention, I mean, look at everything that happened when people focused on COVID. I mean, yes, there was a lot of fear and whatever, but there was also a lot of shifting where huge businesses that were making certain things ended up shifting their entire business operation and plan to making ventilators or making masks. There were yeah. people who opened up little businesses by starting to sew masks. Um, like, and, and I want to say, you know, like all this stuff was, you know, great, but like the imagination was at play. Imagination is always, always at play. And look and, and look at all the stuff that, you know, came out of that. So imagine if that collective energy, that collective consciousness, even a fraction of it, and I know the Ernest Holmes quote, one in consciousness with the infinite constitutes a full majority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but if the collective consciousness and awareness shifted focus to the opioid crisis, what could be done? Like, is it just yeah. that people don't want to look at it because it's too painful? Is it because- I it's don't think it's- not old I don't think it's like that they, they, they don't want to look at it. It's that they can't relate to it. It's not personal. Like the COVID is an immediate threat to me. Mm -hmm. okay. Where most of us are saying, well, I would never be addicted. I would never do that. That's somebody else, you know? And I don't want to word, use the word selfish, but we are self-centered. Mm -hmm. You know, when something thre threatens me personally or very close to me, I'm motivated. But if other people's suffering, well, mm. I mean, you said, I don't, I don't know anything about uh, addiction. I didn't either. Yeah. Nobody in my family had, well, we'd had a few drunks, but you know, it was just different. You know, you didn't expect oh. it was going okay. to, we're not that kind of family. Yeah. You know, the, the wrong kind of life that they probably deserve it, you know? Yeah. And there's judgment, I think. And there's, there's distancing that just people just don't relate to this particular problem. Yeah. Honeymoon, do you have anything? No. No, I'm. I'm just listening. I, yeah, I'm. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I, almost everyone has had a, a life that's been affected by something like this. But um, and you have that scale of you know addiction that some of them are hidden. Like you know, sugar is a huge addiction, right? Um, and in terms of severity and impact um and, and it would be nice if governments did shift focus to prioritize things like this um mm -hmm. when when the numbers are just so clear that um that the harms it's just like it's all i don't get it that because it's like here you know you can show a person the spreadsheet and a series of columns and rows and it's like well this is what's been happening uh and for some reason uh i don't know like because they're in government they're in uh positions of of uh potential huge change they are still some somehow able to divert our attention to something over there because no 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 this is what's going on it's like well no, that's a denial of um, of that very real grief and love that that families are experiencing, and the person mm -hmm. who is in pain, <clears throat> without a doubt, and this is why they're choosing certain addictions. Like, it's a denial of 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 that humanity, you know. And I just I I don't want to say it's unforgivable. It's pretty close. Yeah. I don't I don't. I just don't understand it. And I just think this is where we are, we are with politicians, especially, and the institutions. Uh, because even, even, even um, 
nonprofits, even NGOs can be that, that kind of thing where they are set up to do a thing and then they're, they're, uh, very honest, uh, foundation and, and mission statement and all that is sort of impeccable, but the moment they've been set up, they, they now become something else. They are there to sustain what they do and who they are and yeah. paying the bills for the people who work there. And it happens in government and bureaucracy. And I just think it's, it's, um, it's an ugly aspect of, of, uh, society that we, we allow that to kind of happen. And it's not just like stepping over a person who's sprawled out on the street or like not reaching down to ask if someone's okay, you know, it's this, it's this letting that go. It's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of ugly. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it, you know, all we can do, I guess, is, is focus on the idea that change is possible <clears throat> and that by loving people and seeing them well, you know, this is one of my catchphrases is I see you well, mm -hmm. I see you well, uh, that, that, that helps somewhat because we've got this ability to communicate with one another and to, and to be of service in a way <clears throat> and um, to, to be, to just be that energy of love. I don't know why my throat's going like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because that in itself is still more than, than hoping for change on a societal, institutional, bureaucratic level. It seems to be like that's a dead end over there. I'm not, you know, it's an ugly, it? like, that's, that's like a, it's like a figure eight or something. It just, you get onto that thing and it just goes round and round. And, and what about this? So I'm grateful that you've been able to share that, um, mm -hmm. that kind of, oh, yeah. that kind of reality that is, um, deserving of our attention, you know, like mm -hmm. when I first moved, when we first got to the island from a major metropolis, Toronto, and I would work every day and I would go on the streetcar, subway, streetcar, bus, streetcar every day into downtown and I would see certain things and I experienced certain interactions with people. When I got here and I noticed like, oh, there's, you know, there's like in every bathroom, there's a syringe disposal thing. And, um, uh, you know, I went to first aid and naloxone training and all this kind of stuff when I first got here. Cause I was interested in working in the, um, for Victoria Kool-Aid, uh, or doing volunteering. I did a little bit of volunteering. Um, but I was so like stunned by the, Oh, this is the norm here. Like I didn't see this in Toronto. Was it there and I wasn't seeing it or was my attention not focused on it? But I thought I would have seen it because it was downtown. Like I was in downtown mm -hmm. Toronto every single day, five, you know, four, five or six days a week, I'd be downtown. And, and I, I just, I was like, wow, I, I don't know what priorities are here then. I wasn't sure what was going on how to, yeah. and how to be part of like, like, what do I do? What's my part in this? How, how can I be of service or be any positive impact? Yeah. You know, and also it kind of made me suspicious again of that thing of like institutions, maybe not really just doing the bare minimum or, or, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to badmouth people, but I just, I'm just not sure what's being done. Like, and then mm -hmm. of course we had um, a person that last year worked with once who was a friend for a while, um, Michael Stone, who's a big kind of Zen teacher. Um, Buddhist. Buddhist. And, <clears throat> He, he died in a, um, uh, I guess a fentanyl related th yeah. overdose thing that he sort of a, an event happened in his mental health and it just sort of spiraled very quickly out of control and he went into a coma and all of a sudden we, oh, you're dead. And, you know, and it affects, it affected us. Like we weren't like in his inner circle, but like you realize, oh, he's leaving wife and children behind and and this beloved person in the, in the, you know, um, Buddhist community, it's like, okay, it's 
affects everyone potentially. So can you learn from that? Can you be open your heart a bit and say, you know, um, what can I do? <laughs> so, yeah. So thank you for bringing it up. I don't have any yeah. solutions. Yeah. I think it's essentially a reflection of a non-caring society, you know, a society in which people don't feel valued. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I. <laughs> you have to lighten it up. It's just bad people. Did, did it was, did it was, okay. So actually, I was always saw one thing. So uh, since all eyes kind of switched from COVID to Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, um, I talked about this a bit last week. How I started getting emails and texts from people I haven't heard from in ages, people I don't know very well, just saying we're thinking about you and your family mm -hmm. with everything that's going on in Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian. And, and it was a little bizarre to me, navigated the bizarre feelings and, and whatever was going on for me. But what I really, what I started seeing was that even though there were a lot of people that were focused on what's being shown through legacy and social media um, in terms of fear and war and destruction and demolition, um, annihilation of complete cities, um, there was also a lot of stuff that was starting to come up about peace and compassion and um, and love and and that's something that I'm anchored in like it's all the time that is my go-to that is just I part of my why of you know empowering the conscious awakening of humanity so that together we can cultivate a global community founded in love and so I feel like the door opened for me a little bit um, to speak more about that and not have to hide behind certain language that maybe was more relatable or accessible, that I could just talk more freely about peace, compassion, and love and loving kindness, like we do during our Tuesday night meditations, or maybe I do in the spiritual communities I'm in, but now more to the masses. And so I posted something on Facebook last week and about uh, love, compassion, and peace being states of being and fear worry and anxiety being states of mind and i got a response from someone saying if you're meditating something along the lines of if you're meditating to make things okay in this shitty world that's complicity and and i looked at that and it's someone that i know and uh and i thought oh that's a really interesting response um i don't quite understand it but I wrote something back about meditation and, and how helpful it can be. But basically, you know, I'm thinking, well, if, if up leveling, you know, my consciousness and raising the level of consciousness, you know, of the world by raising my own makes me complicit, then so be it. <laughs> because that's, that's what it is. I mean, when, because we are all consciousness, because we are all energy, because we are all one, um, expressing in our unique original ways, if I am opening myself up more, you know, to experience that flow of loving kindness and compassion and love, that can only happen for those, for everyone else, everyone and everything else. And the more I do it, the more I will find evidence for it in my life. And the more I will continue to, you know, just be grounded and anchored in that. So, it was, it was also, I realized for me that I didn't go like, <gasps> like what, what, you know, and I didn't get all bent out of shape. It's just like, that's your perspective. This is my perspective. And this is what I'm doing. It's not the only thing that I'm doing. And I'm not saying that by doing this, that everything is okie dokie. Um, this is, this is my approach and yeah. I feel good about it. So yeah. it was just a really interesting experience for me. You know, the thing is, if, if you're a prayer, um, again, we're affirmative prayers. We're not asking, we're, we're declaring, we're yeah. accepting. Um, we're praying as much for the Russian army as yeah. we are for the Ukrainian victims. Yeah. Because yeah. they're all just experiencing the lack of love. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There. That's more positive right there. Okay. So how about on that note, Honey Bunch, we move into our next segment, the super rapid fire question round where <laughs> didn't warn Lennis, me about that it's Lennis almost gonna painless. bombard you with questions for one minute and we okay. just want you to answer top of mind no deep thought or introspection here um oh. it's just a fun way to get to know you a little bit better okay um so i'm going to 
dun, 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 get my as quickly as you can with no thinking almost involved zero okay honey bunch oh yeah and then at the end glenn will tell you what you won and as oh, always okay. one is in air quotation marks okay on your mark get set and go okay what's your favorite city to visit she's thinking venice <laughs> oh okay now which do you prefer cats or dogs oh dogs maybe okay. reincarnation or one life Reincarnation. Okay. The Marx Brothers or Bugs Bunny? Marx Brothers. Forgetting or forgiving? Forgiving. Knitting or doing puzzles? Ooh. Knitting. Books or music? Music. Sweet or savory? Sweet. Funny friends or honest friends? Funny friends. Ask for help or go it alone? Oh, go it alone. <laughs> Showers or baths? Showers. 21st century or 20th century? Wow. Wow. <laughs> 20th, 21st century still has some hope, has I'll go with the 21st. There you go. Ding, ding, okay. ding, 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 about 30 okay. seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tough one though that yeah. is all right one. glenn tell um, reverend patricia what she's won since it is almost patty's day uh eternal echoes john o'donohue oh um, oh i love author, john o'donohue yeah and amkara and so forth celtic reflections on our yearning to belong i love this word belong okay again it's i've read this before for one other person it's okay. a blessing May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. May you receive great encouragement when new frontiers beckon. May you respond to the call of your gift and find the courage to follow its path. May the flame of anger free you from falsity. May warmth and of heart Keep your presence aflame, and may anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror an inner dignity of soul. May you take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you be consoled in the secret symmetry of your soul, and may you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, right on. Well, um, let's see. We're almost at the end. Reverend Patricia, if someone wanted to learn more about you or find out more about what it is that you do in this world, where could they go? Uh, I think unityvancouverisland.com. Right. All right. Fantastic. And for those people who might be listening in Nanaimo, Sunday service, What's going on at the at Unity Vancouver? Island? Hey, we can go full capacity tomorrow. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Um, Yay! In two different we're, rooms. We're on yeah. YouTube and Facebook live at ten thirty or ten o'clock. Actually, we have a ten minute meditation, fifteen minute meditation, a fifteen minute musical interview, and then our not an interview, an interlude, and then our service at ten thirty. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I wrote ten thirty down. When is meditation? Ten thirty is the service. Meditation 10, just 10. go on YouTube or Facebook at any time after 10 o'clock okay. and you'll find us. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. And we look forward to coming up next month on yes. the 10th. We're looking forward to that too. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our super special guest today, Reverend Patricia Zogar. Thank you, Honey Bunch, for co-steering the ship as always. And thank you to everyone who has engaged with us, however you've done so, whether you're listening, whether you're watching, whether you joined us live, we are so grateful and thankful for your time and presence. Tune in once again in a couple of weeks. We'll have a brand spanking new episode of Who Do You Think You Are? We look forward to seeing you and we look forward to the next conscious conversation that I know is already making its way forward. Bye for now. Bye, Bye thank, thank you. you. This has been an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? 
and exploration into how our thoughts, beliefs, and feelings create our reality. My name is Lasia Kahoot, and I have been your host. My co-host has been Glenn Sheridan. We'd like to thank the following for helping make this podcast a reality. Today's special guest, Reverend Patricia Zogar. Music, Vasco Lorenko Copyright, 123RF.com. Background illustration, Sock Mysterike Copyright, 123RF.com. For more information on this podcast and our Lassia Kahoot Soul Excavator, please visit www.lassiacahoot.com. If you like what you've heard, please like, subscribe, and let us know by leaving a comment. Thanks for tuning in to Who Do You Think You Are?